my um, May 11th, 2021 Sherburn School Committee meeting. Are you, yeah, you're recording, John? At 6.30 p.m., it is 6.32 and we're starting um, in conjunction with Governor Baker's order. We are allowed to conduct this meeting via Zoom due to the um, mandate that was in place due to COVID and the open meeting law is satisfied by doing this via Zoom. Since we have posted this online on our website and we've given the Zoom links and anyone can join and participate um, remotely. With that being said, we're going to start with our community comments to see if anyone has joined us and would like to um, say anything. Um, just a reminder, community comments um, are just that. You have a chance to voice an opinion or a concern. Unfortunately, it's not a place where we have dialogue, so we won't be giving answers or um, really going back and forth with any uh, meaningful information, but we will obviously take what information you give us. And if you reach out to a representative as well, we'd be happy to speak with you. So we're gonna start with our community comments. And if there's anyone who has a comment, I'm just thankful there's only one screen because it's better than on the joint nights when there's multiple screens. Um, if anyone has anything to say, if you'll just say your name to um, once I call on you and where you're from um, and that's it. Okay, so no community comments. So we're gonna move now to the really um, important one, which is our CSA co-presidents, who I know they've had a challenging year <laughs> because it's really hard to do anything when you rely on fundraising and you don't get to do as much in person as you used to. Um, so it's Broyle Abrams and Tara Horahan, and I wanted to introduce them and I'll let you um, figure out who's speaking first or what you're gonna do. So ladies, take it away. Hi, good evening, I'll start. Um... Although my screen does say on my son, I am Tara Horahan. I'm having trouble changing it. Oh, I can do that. Sorry, I didn't know. Now you can. Oh, okay. We've got strict protocols here on the school accounts. <laughs> gotcha. Now you can. Um, and so I will start with the fundraising. And then I'll also talk about the budget and where we are with the budget. And then Royal will continue the conversation and go into more of the CSA updates that we, uh, things we covered this year. So um, as far as fundraising, so the past CSA presidents, uh, Molly Collum and Hannah Ireland, ran the fundraising portion of the year. I mean, we did have a successful winter fundraiser that met our goal of reaching $21,000. And as part of the fundraiser, Dr. Brown kissed a pony, the kids got a movie day, and the kids even got extra raffle tickets for a raffle basket fundraiser. Um, so that was great and that was fun. And then we also raised funds um, this year through our October 5K, which was held virtually. We also had a virtual book fair um, hosted by Aesop's Fable, and that was successful. Um, that raised as many funds as it has in the past, so that worked out really well. And then we also did have our raffle basket fundraiser again this year. And again, that was as successful as it's been in the past, so that was also great to see. And then this week we're having our last fundraiser of the year. And so fellow Pine Hill parents, uh, Natasha and Troy Clark will be hosting a cocktail event this uh, this Friday evening, night before town meeting. And all are welcome to sign up. It should be great. Troy's um, like a renowned mixologist and uh, looking forward to hearing some tips and tricks from him on making drinks. And like I said, all are welcome. You can sign up on the Pine Hill website if you like. And then as far as events this year, um, you know, non-fundraising events, uh, we did have a snowman uh, making contest and we provided some, some winners with some gifts for that. And we had a holiday wish tree that we put up on Pine Lane. So that was fun to see lit up throughout the holidays. And it was great, you know, for the people in car lines, <laughs> certainly. And then as far as the budget, so we are where we like expected to be um, at this point in the year, which is great um, because some of our fundraisers at the beginning of the year didn't make as much. I mean, we ended up doing really well. Um, so we are where we expected to be. And we do still plan to use about $7,500 from our savings. Uh, we did receive a DSEF grant, which was great and helped offset the cost for the teacher readers we bought at the beginning of the year. 
Um, and we also received a grant from the Sawin Fund, which helped offset a fundraising, or not a fundraising, an enrichment program um, that was held this year. And another great thing is that our enrichment programs like continued really without a hitch. Um, we were still able to schedule and program like plenty of events for the kids. Uh, so that worked out well. And then in addition to the grants we received, we also provided our annual teacher grants this year. Um, and that included math and science reader sets for kindergarten, bird houses for the third grade teachers, which aligns with their curriculum and equipment for a PE class. And then another annual thing we do is that we provide two Pine Hill scholarships to DS graduating seniors who also happen to be um, Pine Hill alum. And so the scholarships, there's two of them for $500. Um, and then we let the winners know by May 31st this year. And then I will let Royal take over from here. Since the last time we updated you in October, we, um, Pine Hill, conducted our like first annual holiday drive for Project Just Because in DCF. Um, and we donate and Pine Hill students donated items to 15 families from Project Just Because and tons and tons of stuff to DCF, new toys and clothes and toiletries. It was fabulous. Um, on the communications aspect, our, our website and our newsletter were both moved to a different platform. Um, we moved to Squarespace. Um, and to get this up and running, it took a, a lot of work and a lot of time. Um, from many people, but right now it is on the new platform and it is up and running and all is great. Um, this has been a really large job this year, especially with everything happening virtually. So it's pretty much the only way we're communicating with everyone. Um, so communications is a huge part of CSA this year. Um, for our Metco family friends, a few activities were held this year um, on Zoom and they included trivia. They had also had a pancake breakfast in April and they're planning on a Sunday play date, which is at um, Lars Anderson Park on June 6th, which more information will be coming on that. Um, we just finished Teacher Appreciation Week and the CSA, you know, along with Dover um, Chickering's um, PTA and the middle school and the high school, you know, encouraged families to create yard signs to show their appreciation and Pine Hill, we kind of, took it a little bit different and um, we wanted families to make their own and they did and they were fabulous. We, you know, put them on the Pine Hill at the road and people had them in their yards. It was really sweet. It was, it came out great. Um, we also provided a teacher breakfast and <clears throat> room parents do their own various things for the class of teachers throughout the week. Um, let's see, the Pine Hill garden is, a lot of work has been done on the Pine Hill Garden this year and you know last year because of COVID it was kind of paused for a bit. Julie Dreyfus and Kristen Suska were behind the scenes really working hard to get the Pine Hill Garden up and running. Um, the bird garden restoration has begun. They got a grant through, with coordination through the sustainability task force and there's been so many volunteers um, helping with this project. High school students fulfilling community, um, community service hours, um, I think an arborist is volunteering some time. So the Pine Hill children are, you know, planting seeds or observing their birds. They're, you know, everything was created with the curriculum. The third grade created bug hotels. There's been so much going on. The kindergarten pumpkin patch is um, in the works. And Kristen and Julie do a great job of involving all the Pine Hill teachers in their plans out there. Um, also, there's a lot of garden information <laughs> when, um, the bird garden is going to be also certified with the National Wildlife Federation and there's more to come on that. And I think the next thing, the access road, um, which we all hope passes on Saturday, we put the information in our newsletters. Um, we're going to write an email on Thursday that goes out to all the parents. Tara put information on next door over the weekend. So hopefully the word is really getting out and people will vote on Saturday. I think that is a quick recap of everything that has been done this year. That is a lot that you all have done. Um, I'm, I'm really impressed actually how well you all did with fundraising and keeping everything on track and keeping the enrichment programs rolling. Um, does anyone on our committee have any questions for Tara or Royal? Can I, can I add one thing, Angie? Yes, Dr. Mm -hmm. Um 
I want to thank you uh, both very much for um, working with our sustainability task force kids and with, with Dorothea, this, uh, the sustainability coordinator in Sherburn. This is how, um, what we determined on the task force at the kind of the district level was that instead of trying to scare kids into appreciating uh, the environment and scare them into all the dangers of climate change, we decided the best approach is to um, make, make them appreciate it and appreciate it by experiencing it. And um, that's what the, those bird gardens are about. Uh, Pine Hill has always done that well, but I appreciate you guys um, being involved with that this year first. And secondly, um, uh, the, uh, I did see your um, statement, Tara, on uh, next door. As the school district, we can't really promote a project that has to go to the taxpayers, but we, but we certainly know, uh, you know that we feel very strongly that it's important and um, otherwise we wouldn't have been putting it forward. So we appreciate your help with that as well. And that is Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. It has to pass at town meeting by a two thirds vote and then uh, at a subsequent uh, ballot uh, at by 50%. So. Uh, we can't afford to uh, let our foot off the glass uh, gas just so people know this thing failed last time by 13 votes. So, um, and it, it could be a real difference maker, uh, a real difference maker for years to come for safety reasons and so much more. So thank you very much for, to both of you. Andrew, what time do you think our vote will come up? Do you have any, does anybody have an inkling? Uh, well, they did the practice meeting last night and actually, Angie, it went pretty quickly. Okay. I thought I thought I would be sitting there for at least an hour before we got to that. Now that wasn't a typical town meeting, but anyone who had anything to say was likely to be at that meeting, and um, or a lot of the people were. And I'd say it was about 35, 40 minutes in. Okay. And unfortunately, I can't be there because it's my daughter's graduation. So at exactly the same time. So. Um, did that, Andrew, did that vote come before or after the turf vote? It came right, it, it was right after it. Right after it. I anticipate there's going to be a lot of discussion around that. Uh, there was last night too, Megan. And yeah. basically, um, uh, Mary Wolf has put all of the capital items into a consent agenda. So... Um, and they'll read through them and then they'll vote on the consent agenda, which approves all at once. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to hear more information or challenge something, they'll just say hold. And then that item will be discussed further. So um, I don't, I mean, we were done last night. It started at seven and we were done at um, like probably like 930. But there was a lot of, um, um, you know, working out the details. So I think, I think Saturday morning is actually going to run very smoothly. But it was, uh, yes, the fields were, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a lot more um, resistance, I would say, from the mm. people on that meeting, on that meeting. And then, um, and we seem to have pretty good support for the road. Sean Killeen has done a great job getting the, the prices. The, he had an estimate done uh, by engineers and it's come in under what was uh, put in the, uh, in the uh, warrant article. So it's a $1.3 million project, uh, which is not small potatoes, but hopefully the people from town will uh, agree that it's worth. Well, so bring your friends and neighbors. You know, I'm bringing my daughter. She looked at me, she goes, can I vote? And I went, oh, you can, and you will be. You'll be coming with me at 10 a.m. <laughs> she can be my vote, Angie. Yeah, she'll be, <laughs> she got home um, Sunday night at 11.45, and she goes, oh, boy. And I was like, I know, aren't you excited? So I'll be bringing <laughs> her and my husband. It's going to be a family affair. I will say this. It might be wise to put the word out to people that parking at, at Butler Street at the DPW is going to be pretty tight. So yeah. people would be wise to park yeah. on Pine Hill Lane or downtown, probably probably Pine Hill Lane so as to not to take business spots. Okay, all right. Well, thank you ladies. I can't thank you enough 
for keeping our CSA on track and enriching the children and making sure that they have as normal of a year, even in COVID as possible. So I know it's been a lot of work. And so I appreciate you and all your volunteers and your board. So thank all of them and tell them we know it's been a lot of, a lot of work, but it's most appreciated. So it doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you. Yes, we couldn't have done it without everyone. Well, thank you, ladies. And if you all need anything, you know, you can reach out to us at any time. Um, you know, we're, we're always here and we'll do what we can. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Andrea, I just have one question. This is Dennis. Um, is there formal lines of communication between the CSA and the school committee or? Um... We have a liaison. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a liaison from, this, from our, to the CSA, but usually too, if there's an issue, they'll just, they'll just contact us. Um, you know, and I, I stay abreast of all the information because I got, I was asked to, asked to be added to all the communications. So I see the new communications and the new website and everything. It looks fabulous, by the way, because I, you know, when it comes to me, I click on it. I'm like, this is great. It gives me all the updates, even though my child is no longer at Pine Hill, it gives me just community updates too. So it's always good. It's very, um, very succinct and, and informative. So I appreciate it. But yes, Dennis, there is one and it's in your package. Um, you can, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it, but yeah, we have a, we have a direct person that is a liaison with them. All right. Well, if that's, that was, um, CSA, you all are welcome to stay, but you don't feel like you have to, um, Next, we're gonna to move to Reader's Workshop, the curriculum update, which I'm excited about. Um, so I can't wait to hear what all is going on with that now. So that- Angie, is, it, it yeah. might make sense to have um, Beth just introduce to Beth, if you don't mind, putting putting it all in perspective so that Jen and, um, and, uh, Jen and um, Allison can kick right in. Sure. Um, so Pine Hill adopted the Teachers College reading and writing um, units of study several years ago. And it wasn't until Jen Bryan joined us as a literacy specialist um, that we were able to kick it into high gear and really make sure that um, all of our classrooms and students had access to the uh, units of study and the workshop. So thanks to Jen and her muscle power and her coaching with teachers, uh, it's really made a difference. The exciting news is that uh, Chickering is now adopting the uh, reading units of study as well. So this is gonna be the first time in forever that Chickering and Pine Hill are following the same curriculum and the same model of instruction and the same assessments and reading. Um, we will have the writing discussion uh, soon after they find the success of the reading program. Um, so it's just great that we continue to collaborate across the river and find more commonalities and more ways to collaborate. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jen Ryan, our literacy specialist and Allison Gullingsrud, who you know is our assistant principal, who are gonna give you an update on where we are uh, and where we're headed with the workshop model. Awesome. Jen, do you wanna uh, share our slides? I would love to. Hi everybody, thanks for welcoming us and letting us share a little bit with you. Um, okay. All right, so um, we know that Beth set out the video in advance, so hopefully everyone had an opportunity to watch that. Um, but if not, what we want to do tonight is just provide some highlights. So some of it's a little redundant from the video, but just kind of pull some things out that we thought were really important to share. So um, at Pine Hill, uh, full implementation of reading units of study next year alongside with Chickering. Um, it's really exciting. This is a program that um, we have seen the growth in our children and have had the opportunity to send teachers already to Teachers College in Columbia, which is where it's um, rooted from. And it's just um, exciting that we can align ourselves because our students end up in the same place. Um, so giving them that shared experience is um, something that we're really excited about. So the curriculum itself, um, different from like a basal program, which is really traditional. Um, what's great about this curriculum is that you have, you know, your curriculum and if you're a new teacher, you can follow it lesson by lesson. Um, it is, you know, scripted out and, and easy to follow. But for our veteran teachers and for teachers who are more experienced with the curriculum, um, it gives you the chance to really be responsive to your students' needs. 
So even I was at um, a conference once and Lucy Hawkins, who was the author of all this work, um, once said, you shouldn't be following lesson by lesson because you're not being responsive to the children in front of you. Um, and she's the writer of this curriculum. So it's not about day one, day two, it's about um, understanding the fundamentals of readers workshop and then responding to the needs that you see in front of you. So it's a really beautiful thing to see in action. Um, so part of this curriculum is, you know, the units of study, the, the spirals that teachers receive themselves, but a huge part of it is also the classroom libraries. And it's really important as part of this um, curriculum, you know, a, a large tenet is that our children see themselves in the books that they are reading. Um, so we've been working to diversify our classroom libraries and ensure that students have a wide selection of texts and that choice is such a huge component, right? We're not giving everyone's going to read this book, um, but children are choosing books and we want them to be able to choose books that are um, culturally proficient and that they can see themselves in. Um, a huge other component um, to bring to light is that, you know, professional development that's ongoing is huge as well as coaching. So we're hoping to team with Teachers College um, next year and have staff developers come out across both schools to help support the work that we're doing, as well as we have Jen Ryan at our school um, and a literacy coach at Chickering who are gonna be on the, on the ground and have already done so much work with our teachers. And that's huge because it's not a, here's your curriculum, good luck, um, off you go. It's instead, it's it's reflective, and we're um, working alongside you, and we're partnering, and we're figuring things out, and being flexible, and again responsive um, to the needs of our students. So those are kind of the three major um, tenets of this adoption, and um, we've already had the opportunity to see a lot of it in action in our classrooms. So I'd like to share a little bit about um, the the. Um, important concepts that this program and this pedagogy are based in. And our hope and our dream is that for all students in Sherburne and in Dover in grades K through five to engage in um, these units of study and maybe one day even beyond um, so that all students have a well articulated, consistent approach to learning uh, about reading, uh, language, philosophy, academic culture. Um, and then as both elementary schools feed the middle school this way, the middle school teachers will have an, a better understanding of what kids are coming prepared to do, which should translate to um, less learning loss at those important transition points. So some of the tenets of uh, the reading units of study out of Teachers College are deep immersion. Um, students are immersed in rich text that's thought provoking, that's diverse, that is also at their own uh, instructional and independent reading level so that they can access uh, the text that they need to move forward. Um, we are aiming, as I said before, towards cohesion to maximize learning and progress. We believe that this this program and this approach will increase equity because all students, regardless of who their teacher is or the experience that they've had, will receive the same quality instruction. We um, love the incredible intentionality that is incorporated in this program. Lessons are all research-based. They spiral and uh, build on um, each one day to day, unit to unit, and then year to year. Um, one of the, the most important beliefs is uh, in authenticity. It's that students are apprentices. They're apprenticing the lives of readers every single day. So we're not teaching them to be, you know, expert test takers. We're teaching them to love reading, to read deeply and closely and to utilize skills that that they'll that they'll hold on to for their lives. Um, differentiation is a cornerstone of of the reading units of study. So teachers offer daily mini lessons. Um, but the majority of the time spent in instruction is in response to the students that are in front of them. Teachers um, confer one-to-one -one with students 
with individualized teaching points and engage in small group instruction. And this happens every single day. Uh, the program also um, builds teacher proficiency. So as Allison mentioned, there's um, important coaching and professional development in um, the best practices, but also the units of study themselves help bolster teacher proficiency. Uh, they, they believe that reading is an art and a science and as teachers read these lessons plan, lesson plans, they learn a little bit more every day on, on how students become stronger readers. Um, and as I said, reading is one of the most important life skills that students learn in school. And so we're, we're learning to think critically, analyze deeply, question, infer, and also to read the words on a page every single day. So um, we also created um, a literacy roadmap, which is a, a five-year plan because um, rolling out a curriculum is really important, but again, it's not something we wanna plunk in our teacher's hands and say, good luck, um, but we wanted to be really thoughtful about the approach that we take so that we can ensure success for our students and for our teachers. Um, so we created a document that essentially um, outlines five, uh, the five years and components that we found um, to be important. So it, the literacy overview just kind of talks through what are the big, big ideas each year that we want to make sure to focus on. And within that work, we embed both tier one instructional practices as well as tier two. So thinking about our interventions as well, because we want to weave that in um, to our rollout. Um, and then each year is broken down um, into six different things. So talking about what, what are the programs, and this goes a little bit beyond just reading units of study. We want to talk about existing programs that we already have. Where do those fit in? Where does phonics fit in? Um, so we tried to uh, incorporate literacy in, in a broad sense. Um, assessment, assessments and benchmarks. So, you know, how are we assessing our readers? Um, professional development and coaching, which is such a key component as Jen spoke to um, with this rollout. And then we break it down into tier one practices. So our tier one is essentially um, meeting the needs of 80% of our students. So that students all have access to that. Tier two is, you know, for the students who aren't necessarily making the effective progress we would like to see in tier one, they need a little second dose of something. So what specifically does that look like? Um, and each year we talked about different things to kind of focus on um, to ensure that we're really um, making sure all students are successful. And then we also thought it was essential and important that we have a social justice lens through literacy. Um, and so wanted to incorporate that as we're rolling out this program as that's a, a huge tenant of this. And so we are uh, fortunate at Pine Hill because we have been um, rolling the units of study out over the last few years. We have some concrete data that supports the adoption of the units of study. So two years ago, um, as, as you know, I believe I, came and spoke and shared with you a little bit. Um, we started to have some early adopters, some teachers uh, roll out the teaching of the units of study. And we engaged in a lot of whole faculty professional development around the best practices um, that are uh, the important parts of the program. And this year, um, almost all teachers have engaged in the curriculum. And so we have learned uh, a few things. One is that, as, as we expected um, at the beginning of this school year, because of the pandemic and remote learning last spring, there were some dips in um, reading proficiency. So our scores w uh, went down a little bit compared to previous years. In the classrooms that um, had robust implementation of the Teachers College Units of Study, those gaps were closed for students by the next assessment point. So from fall to um, early spring, late winter, and students completely made up for their losses, which, which was incredible. Um, first year teachers, so, you know, learning how to teach uh, takes a few years to, to build capacity <laughs> and we have a, a lot of wonderful first year teachers this year that we're so excited about. And historically, first year teachers 
um, exhibit smaller gains in reading proficiency there's for their students. Um, however, this year, all of our first year teachers were trained, coached, mentored and implemented the units of study um, thoroughly and their students either made similar or greater progress in reading than even some experienced teachers who um, have not yet implemented the, the units of study. And um, also uh, just, just as a little kind of backstory, we've been using some homegrown um, readers workshop units at our school for a while now. And um, though the workshop philosophy is similar, teachers were writing their own units and their own lessons. And that led to a uh, less consistent experience for some of our students. And students ended up planning uh, in isolation. And um, now with these units to share, teams of teachers that are piloting the units of study are doing so collaboratively. They're engaging in the work together. And this has really amped up the consistency for our students. Um, they, you know, across the grades and then vertically up the grades are, are thinking and learning and practicing in really similar ways. So that's been, been very exciting to see. So uh, we're happy to answer questions if anybody has any. I know we've thrown a lot of information at you. Jen, can I, uh, Jen or Allison, can I ask a quick question? That's sure. okay with you, Angie. Um, so, you know, people say that these interventions, the tier one and the, the especially the tier two interventions uh, reduce referrals for special education. Are we seeing any of that? And will we continue to track that? So yeah, so we are tracking that and that is the goal. So as we bolster our tier one instruction and the teacher's ability to differentiate within tier one, fewer students will theoretically fall into the tier two category, which thereby means that fewer students will fall into tier three and hopefully referrals will uh, decrease. Um, you know, we're at the beginning of the adoption, so we'll, closely monitor uh, those numbers, but um, we are very hopeful and encouraged by what we're seeing in classrooms in teachers' ability to work in a more differentiated small group and individualized way for longer periods of time and more frequently throughout the week. That's great. To add to that too, I think so often it's easy to jump to tier two interventions. Oh my goodness, this kid, you know, they're not making progress. Let's put in all these interventions. Um, but I think what this work has done for our teachers and students is make it really reflective on, well, let's step back and look at our tier one. There's so many other things we can put in place before we even jump to that. So if we're not even differentiating for our students, you know, of course they're not making progress. But you know, so going back to that tier one practice, I think is really important too. So it's been great to see through Jen's coaching, um, the expansion of our tier one practices in, in literacy. And, and one of the things that I love most about the units of study is that um, the tools that are um, associated with the program enable teachers to look at students along developmental continuums instead of just at like a this is what's expected in third grade and so is the child meeting third grade benchmark or not instead it lets teachers analyze student work and place them along these continuums so that they know exactly what's next how to nudge them along within their class so you don't you you might have a student who in one area of reading is is in third grade but presenting at a first grade level and you don't have to be a first grade teacher to know what to do for them because mm -hmm. those tools for differentiated differentiation are um, woven throughout the entire program great thank you yeah. questions how long how long do you guys expect to kind of take to get a baseline on how to measure and adjust as you're going recognizing that this is sort of an early program that sounds fantastic do you guys feel like you already have metrics and the measurement tools to sort of help push folks along or is there sort of a couple year period to, to burn this in to really understand to evaluate um, impact or performance 
I think we already have some early data this year because so many teachers are using it. So just those, um, those reading uh, scores from fall to winter show that students made significant gains. But I think what will really, and Allison, feel free to jump in here, but what will really be telling is um, next year's data compared to this year's and then another year after that, because we'll be able to see after a full year of implementation um, if students are coming to the next school year more prepared. Um, and then after they've been engaged in the program for several years in a row, you know, how that's impacted their learning. And I think while this is, I mean, technically more anecdotal data, both Dr. Brown and I through observations, um, and this is part of our, we'll speak later about our school improvement plan, but thinking about, you know, when we're going into classrooms with an observation lens, you know, seeing the growth that our teachers make and documenting that. So um, obviously our student, you know, it, their growth impacts student growth, but seeing firsthand and being able to nudge them um, to help support the work with our students is also another form of data that we're looking at um, to make sure that we're seeing increased in um, practices that our teachers are using as well. That was and actually, I Alice, sorry, okay. I was just, I was just going to ask Allison that kind of touches on something I was wondering about is kind of how how are you identifying where where you want to scale this in the school and what's the plan to kind of continue to scale and build it um, among across across the grades. So this year it's across all the grade levels right now um, already um, and then next year um, it's an expectation. Our hope is that everyone is um, taking it on. Um, this year, the focus has really been um, that new new teacher cohort. Um, they fully implemented it. You know, they haven't had something already existing that they've been using, so it's kind of an easier entry point um, to start with. But like Jen had mentioned, all of our teachers have participated in these professional developments um, for a couple years now, which have the same practices that are embedded within this program. So it's not like brand new information for everyone that we're taking on. Um, so our goal next year is to support at the grade level team. And then from that work, Jen, you know, skillfully figures out who she needs to go in and coach to. And just like we respond to our students' needs, you know, she's really great at responding to the needs of our teachers based on um, what what's going on with them. So it's hard to have a, you know, we're going to target this, 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 because we want to be responsive to um, our teachers' needs as well. But the goal is obviously to support building wide next year um, across our grade level teams. I believe uh, by the end of this summer, all but three of our 20 classroom teachers will have had the support of launching through a course at Teachers College, which provides the philosophical uh -huh. understanding for this instructional model, the uh, school committee support in um, the literacy specialist position two years ago um, has been integral or uh, the job embedded professional development that all of our teachers have access to is obviously rich and ongoing. Um, so, so there's, there's um, teachers have worked with Jen individually as teams, as new teacher cohorts, as teachers who are um, working to have a more sophisticated reciprocity between the reader's workshop and the writer's workshop. Um, they have some advanced entry points that they work with Jen on. So uh, the job embedded professional development partnered with the teacher's college course, uh, and there's not just one course, you can take infinite courses through Teachers College, um, uh, has absolutely uh, writ enriched uh, the depth of analysis that teachers are able to do with their readers. If I could just add one more piece, as Jen mentioned, um, or I think it was Allison mentioned that our, our fifth graders from Chickering and Pine Hill both land in the same place, which is obviously Dover Shore Middle School. And they are in the early stages of exploring the workshop model. They have purchased the teacher manuals. They're gonna be engaging with Teachers College this summer for some professional development. Um, and thanks to some creative scheduling by Anna Hurley at the middle school, the sixth grade teachers have been able to come down to Pine Hill and spend a lot of time with the fifth grade teachers and Jen talking about that matriculation between the two schools um, and how to further differentiate um, at the middle school, which we know you know, is one step closer to that high school college model. Um, so really getting the middle school teachers to think about how they can um, 
teach the same concept, but to students using different books and different methods. So um, it's really exciting and we hope to have an update about K through eight rollout um, in the next few years. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm a big fan and I think it's, it's been wonderful so far. So thank you all for your work on it. It's fantastic. We're very excited about it. So thank you for your support. I may have missed this or just being thick. It sounds like not everybody is sort of engaged. Not all of the teachers are engaged or is that just on the education opportunities for them inside of it? You said like 20 of 23 or something? By the end of this summer, 17 of 23 of our classroom teachers, K-5, will have had the uh, Reader's Workshop course through Teachers College. That's not the only way. They all have the materials and it is, it's no longer something that we're encouraging people to delve into. It's a requirement for uh, mm -hmm. common language and co a common uh, best practice across, across our grade levels next year. And all uh, teachers so have been engaging in in-house professional development um, for the last two years and um, there have been um, differing levels of coaching, depending on, as Allison said, if you're in a new teacher cohort or, or not in the past two years. But um, next year, 100% of our teachers will be using the units of study. And, um, and it's wonderful. I mean, I, I can also say, since I am fortunate to have the K-5 observational lens at our school, and I've been a teacher at, at Pine Hill for a long time, um, one of the most beautiful shifts that we've seen is in the amount of time that students are engaging in the work of learning how to read. Um, you know, when you're on the sports field, you don't learn how to play soccer by listening to your coach tell you about soccer, right? And so um, it's the same with reading. You, you really don't learn how to read by sitting and listening to a teacher lecture about how to read. You, you, hear important lessons, but then you have to practice that skill and you need to practice that skill with the support of a coach. And so now when I walk into classrooms, I see teachers giving whole group instruction for a really short period of time, five to 10 minutes, and then kids are practicing the skills and the teacher's right there next to them, coaching and offering differentiated support for, a, for the remainder of that hour. And that's every day. So we're really enabling students to maximize progress. Um, because of not only the time in learning and practice, but the quality of instruction differentiation. So it's, it's, been, it's been really exciting and really beautiful to see this shift start to take root. Anybody else? Well, thank you all. I'm hoping we'll have a lifetime of people who love to read because of this, because I think some kids get so frustrated and um, when they aren't getting it. And so I'm I'm thinking this model is so much better and it will hopefully endear them to want to do this for fun, not just for school. So. And Angie, can I just add from the financial side, we have made a substantial investment in this program this year. We've used uh, available grant funds across multiple of um, different grant funding opportunities that we have to not only purchase the units of study, but we've also spent the time, uh, these guys have purchased uh, increased uh, um, classroom library selections for each of the classrooms. So that, that's another reason we just want to bring this forward tonight because we have we have made a substantial investment that I just wanted to make sure the school committee was aware that, um, you know, we've, we've, we've shored this up not only with the great staff that we have, but with the materials that are important to make sure this is a successful program. Just want to okay. say one thing, you know, uh, the remote Wednesdays and um, the videos that Miss Ryan puts together, you know, there's a secret weapon there. And I think they're just, they're absolutely top notch. They're excellent. And it really does, uh, you know, Jen, you really, really break it down for the kids. I just, um, I look forward, I'm like, is there one for this? Ryan that we can look at? So anyway, thank you so much for all you do. And I agree, I think this program is excellent. Oh, thank you so much. We're really, we are really, really fortunate to have Jen and Allison uh, taking a lead role in this, obviously with Barb's support and with Beth's support. But um, uh, Jen has, as she said, taught with these folks and um, has established relationships. So I don't think she comes across as threatening if she's making suggestions in this regard. And that's a beautiful thing. 
because that can can really go south if it's not handled correctly. So we're very lucky to have Jen and, and I. Uh, all of you guys have done a great job with it. So thank you. Yeah, and remember we were you know we're stri striving for equity between the two elementary. So now we're in line with the staffing that Chickering has, and so now having this common um, programming is going to be great. That the two they the two of them have each other. Great to uh, to uh, continue to build across both elementaries. The I, teachers I forgot about that, uh, Don. That's a really good point. We right. did not have the literacy coordinator uh, just a few years ago, so this has been a great thing. The students and the teachers at Pine Hill call Jen Coach Ryan, which I think is very very telling. I like that, and she was right about the soccer. You're right. You have to practice everything. So, okay. So with that. Um, wrapping up, we'll go on to our principal's report, Dr. Brown. So, Well, good evening, everyone. We, uh, uh, my last principal's report was just three instructional weeks ago with the school vacation break. Uh, so I kept it short and sweet knowing our agenda was um, uh, uh, pretty long tonight. Um, since our last school committee meeting, we have rolled into phase four of school reopening. Easy peasy at the elementary level uh, with the um, with adding Wednesdays, we had already done all the heavy lifting with staffing and space plans and uh, tweaking the schedules. Uh, um, uh, you know, our, our, our middle and high schools had to do a lot more of that with this last phase uh, than the elementary schools did. So we are um, delighted that our children have the consistency of uh, full in-person learning. At this time, I, I believe Dr. Keogh reported on this at the last joint school committee meeting. Uh, at this time, we have about 19 of our children who are still in the remote learning academy and a small handful of children still in homeschool programs. Um, I obviously have been in touch with all of those families and you know, have them um, considered in our projections for class placement and all of those things we're organizing for next year. Um, so school reopening, it's very smooth. Um, I um, wanted to give a shout out to our CSA and all the Sherburn families for an extra special teacher appreciation week. The, um, I, I won't repeat what our CSA members have already shared, but it was a, um, um, an extra colorful spring in Sherbourne and, and I'm sure Dover as well with, um, with all of the heartfelt messaging that our, that our families put out there on behalf of um, the educators. Uh, DSEF, as you know, is collecting uh, grant proposals for next year. Uh, Pine Hill submitted two pretty lofty grants last week. We look forward to uh, continuing through the grant, the grant process and we'll keep you posted um, uh, when, we, when we have more information. Uh, MCAS kicked off today, and uh, I'm glad to say without, without any big hitches. Nancy, I can't tell uh, if you're oh, can raising- I, Can I just ask a quick question? Is one of the grants still the outside classroom? It is, um, yes. and, and okay. we're leading great. with that. Um, it's okay, a $41,000 grant, so, uh, so we're leading with that grant. It's, it's a big ask and um, uh, timely uh, with the pandemic and um, uh, spending as much time outdoors, educationally speaking, as, uh, as we've done this year, uh, it was a reminder to uh, to take better advantage of the beautiful property around our school for, for uh, continued, continued educational value. So we did submit that grant and we submitted another, actually Marlene Custodio, who's our teacher rep, who's, who's here at the, um, on, on our Zoom screen tonight. Marlene submitted a grant on behalf of our school uh, to ask for um, uh, outdoor seating so that teachers can work and eat with their classrooms outdoors. As you know, we, we um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we have a very structured way that we feed our children in controlled groups inside and um, eating snack outside and spending more time outside is um, uh, something that the teachers have valued and want to continue. So, um,
those are the big, big, big pieces. I, I spoke in, um, in my report about the rich professional development that's been going on the past month with Jen Ryan and our new teachers. I, 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 I don't want to, um, spend too much time on that because it really was embedded in, in the overview they just provided you. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention one other piece. Um, we were, we were um, very welcoming um, in having Jeff Parati come back and work with our faculty uh, twice last month. Uh, Jeff is a consultant for the Department of Education and a professor of positive psychology at Harvard University. And we started working with him about seven years ago and um, recently spent some time with him to tune and refine our practices so that our students uh, who are LBGTQIA, as the children now remind me to add the IA, um, uh, are um, sure to experience a safe space within, uh, within our, our comprehensive school setting. So we've been doing work uh, specifically around gender identity and it's been rich and rewarding. So that's all I have, unless you have questions of me. Nancy already got one question, which I, I yeah, and I'm questions. sorry if I'm the no, go ahead, person that I didn't know about the, the outdoor classroom. So if there's anything else that's fun like that, I'd like to know too. The IA, I'm not sure what that means. So I, I maybe every, I'm not hip to that. So uh, I, I, I intersex and a asexual. And our fifth okay. grade students are very, very astute and are pushing us all to um, to be um, uh, not just inclusive in our practices, but to be talking about um, what they are uh, wrestling with and exploring within their journeys. So um, it's a new generation and the world, the world continues to evolve. And um, I uh, find it very rewarding following, following the leads of our, our bright activist youth. It is. It's. It's. It's a. It is a. It's a, again. That's why I asked. It's always. I'm always learning as well. I don't feel like I get all the information. You know. So anyway, thank you very much. That's We've great. um. In, in this this dovetails. I know. I know this is later in in the agenda, um. But are, uh, you know, certainly aware of uh, families who have shared their journeys with us for children that have uh, been born the wrong the wrong sex and have made social transitions uh, upon realizing that. Uh, this year, I had more personal experience with students sharing with me that they didn't identify with either gender and our binary system for mailing everything. and femaling everything uh, is, is perhaps dated. So you'll notice one of the changes in the roster of things that we have updated in our handbook is to scrub our handbook of gender specific pronouns in uh, support of um, uh, being inclusive. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? It's a lot of work, Dr. Brown. I'm excited. It's, it's never dull and boring in, in this in this profession and certainly at Pine Hill. Um, and I mean that sincerely. Apparently you got to kiss a pony, which we all missed, but. <laughs> um, what I didn't show the students was the blooper that when I, when I went to engage with Hugo, he completely turned his back on me. I only showed them the successful take when I bribed him with some oats ahead of time. Very good. Well, it was Barb, I noticed you didn't you didn't share share your uh, story about the great horned owl that was rescued. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, we did tweet that out. You may have seen. Uh, oh, about, yeah. a, about a week ago, our first graders were out for an early morning uh, recess break, and one of our fifth grades happened to be uh, one of our teachers took her fifth graders out for a for a wiggle break, they were, they were uh, walking the, the perimeter of the property and they came together at the same time in realization that a great horned owl was tangled in our soccer net on the front playground. And of course, Mr. Gimlet to the rescue uh, went out there and snipped, snipped some of the rope and the owl took off and we have a fabulous video and the children squealing with joy and it, it 
I mean, you just. Only on the hill, Barb. Only Only on on the the hill. I don't know if you can see, but there's the picture that Peter sent me. So there's the owl in the net. Unbelievable. And the colorful ball right next to it. (laughs) It was a a happy ending, thank goodness. If you expanded the eyes, we're like, whoa, Mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, I mean, you know, we pay somewhere around $15,000 a year for the Broadmoor education for our children. <laughs> this, this was up close, personal and free. And a teacher happened to catch it in video. So we were able to stream it to all of the classrooms. <laughs> and and uh, it, it, it was a pretty special experience. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. I, I think you live in the enchanted forest over at Pine Hill. As well, <laughs> I can imagine. So, there you go. All right, so Dawn, next we have the war report, if there's anything. Pretty straightforward. It's a little bit longer since you hadn't um, met since March, but um, you can see the different funds. In the next report you'll see, you'll actually see the different title funds and such that we use for some of the um, the literacy curriculum uh, items. Uh, But that's that's, um, what we have for this couple of months here. And I, again, always thank Angie for going over to Town Hall and being the school committee signer for um, all this paperwork that gets pushed through. A lot of paperwork. Sometimes my paperwork gets shimmied with others I've noticed. I'm like, oh, that's not me. Cause like I had a Park and Rex one. I was like, no, no, I'm not signing anything for Park and Rex today. <laughs> so next we have our financial report. Go on, and I'm gonna. So I've, I've continued um, a sort of the um, thought process of giving you a running report and the items that are in bold are the new pieces of information. Uh, And so we have two pieces on the salaries and one is that now we're getting closer to June 30th and there's several of the grants that need to be expended by um, June 30th. Uh, That's when the the grant period ends. So we were able to go back and reevaluate and take some of the salaries of the added educational assistance in your general fund and move them over to the CARES grant. Uh, So we took about $22,000 uh, from the general fund over to the CARES grant, which is going to obviously increase your positive salary variance that we've been reporting. And in addition, um, just going through and looking that there's several other positions that have ch- had staffing changes during the year, mostly non-teaching, um, but those have also generated some savings. So we've increased your salary savings in the general fund up to about $240,000. That may still continue to grow a little bit because what we haven't included in there um, uh, is you know, still budgeted overtime we have for custodians as they need, um, a little bit of substitute time. So that may continue to grow just a little bit, but that gives you sort of an overview that we've had a very positive experience with salaries and, and how much just a few staffing changes can impact those, um, you know, your financial statements. Keep in mind that some of these positive financial statements are what allowed you to have almost a 0% increase in your budget for fiscal year 22, because we were able to capture those in building the budget for 22. On the expenditure side, there really is nothing new to report. We did see a little bit of a continued increase in your special ed services. So that number uh, went up to 18,000. Um, and on the out of district, since the last time we met, we have had one mid-year replacement. So we have seen a slight decrease in your positive variance in out of district. Um, it was about 50,000, it's out, down at $35,000 now um, because of that mid-year placement. Um, in your next set of financial statements, I do have a couple of credits that we've been receiving from Accept, our collaborative, where we do have students attending. and. Um, based on um, some surpluses they have uh, and giving back to the member communities, um, we will reflect some additional about $20,000 positive uh, experience you'll see in your out of district come your June statements. So um, luckily I'm only sharing with you good news on the financial end and let's just hope it stays that way. Um, Sherburn will see, the town of Sherburn should see a pretty significant uh, turn back from the um, elementary school in the audit district, which should help them in the future with their, with their free cash. Um, I've also given you an update on your um, COVID related grants. Um, I think since the last time we met, the numbers have sort of been um, sort of published for the American Rescue Plan. We're just now sort of getting the guidance on the use of that money. Um, Pine Hill received about $170,000 that money is good for COVID-related 
pandemic um, related outcomes or, 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 or things that we need all the way through the fall of fiscal year 24. So there's protections there for us to continue to, um, you know, do whatever, any kind of um, learning loss, um, social emotional support that we need to bring ourselves all back um, to some place better than where we were during the pandemic. And uh, they've made sure that at the federal and the state level that we have the funds. So we're not taxing our own regular operating budgets. So these will all be things that we don't budget for on a normal basis that we can add as we need in the coming years and it's funding provided to cover it. Questions for Dawn? It all looks good. Mm. Oh, and you have your quarterly special revenue revolving fund to report. Yeah, and I saw, because I saw that we had some um, some um, additions for, you know, rentals and things too on, on one of the sheets as well. Yeah. Great. So does anybody have any, anything to add? It looks good to me. Yeah, happy, good report. Yeah, I like a good report. Okay, so next on our agenda items is the proposed changes to the 2021-22 student handbooks. Um, which Dr. Brown, I guess she'll take this over. And like you said, one thing was to um, take the identifying pronouns out. Um, and I'm sure there are some other, I read through, and if you didn't, I printed a large portion of the handbook, not meaning to, but I did, didn't I, Dr. Brown? So You did, you did. Um, in your packet is a copy of our handbook and a copy of a supplement guide that we put out um, in September. This one is specific to the hybrid learning model. Uh, I, uh, good news, bad news, Allison put our handbook in a new uh, program called Canva. So it is pretty and it is visually appealing. I didn't realize until uh, last week that I couldn't go into that program and do the strike through and highlight changes. And that's how I used to let you know what we changed in the handbook. Um, so uh, what I did was make a um, uh, just a visual grid so you could um, reference uh, what we're recommending changing and um, adding. We had done a real thorough scrub of our handbook last year. Um, as you know, we periodically receive recommended language from our legal counsel and or school committee policy updates, which then require us to update the handbook. At this time, there's there, there's none of those, change, there's no changes pending from either of those sources. Those, you know, they don't necessarily come this time of year, they come throughout the year. Um, we have some nominal changes, which, which I uh, uh, highlighted for you. Um, a few things that change annually because of updates such as faculty roster, uh, uh, we changed uh, information specific to all school meetings to reflect the start time changes and our current format of, of gathering in assembly is through Zoom. Uh, arrival dismissal was changed to reflect the, the uh, school day adjustment. Uh, we updated language uh, around the music and band program. As you recall last year, you supported our request to increase uh, Mr. Davis, our instrumental and band teacher, so that Sherpin children could have an equitable experience to those in Dover by receiving lessons during the school day at no charge to parents. Um, so I, I, I embellished the language just so that that would be a little bit clearer. Uh, school committee member names were updated. Um, I see us having uh, a supplemental guide with relative to the COVID guidelines, I don't see us updating that until probably mid-August based on uh, all of the work and discussions we have this summer with our Board of Health uh, guidelines from CDC and Department of Ed. Uh, but obviously we will provide uh, information for families about mask wearing and distancing and any adjustments that we need to make to eating routines or playing routines or transitions uh, based on uh, our understood uh, guidelines at that time. I added information about community education. It's on our website, uh, but, but I uh, was thinking about the number of new families uh, 
that we meet throughout any given year, um, specifically around extended extended uh, day childcare. Um, and I anticipate uh, with the access road project, fingers crossed, uh, that we will want to add a whole bunch of updated information around parking and car lanes and bus lanes and, and maybe even some maps in the handbook. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll know definitively about that project and those changes uh, in, in the weeks to come. Uh, and I mentioned uh, I wanted to um, follow the lead of some fabulous and insightful fifth grade students who have been keeping me apprised of their thoughts and feelings. We had a meeting just yesterday and uh, um, I want to reflect best practice and scrub our handbook of uh, gender specific pronouns. So those, those are the big overarching uh, changes in the handbook. This is our first read, so we'll do. We have to vote on it the next time. Is that correct? Is that is correct. So, um, you know, if there's anything anyone sees, um, but as it stands now, this is our first read at it, and so if it stands as it is, this, the next time you see this, we will vote. So the next portion is the school improvement plan, Dr. Brown. I think that's still you as well. It is, and I. I think Allison Gullingsrud may have ducked off. She texted me that she had a, her, her daughter's been under the weather. She, she and I were going to share talking about the school improvement plan, but obviously um, she has been integral to, um, to helping to develop this as well. Um, our school improvement plan is beautifully aligned with uh, the bigger goals and objectives that our school system is working on. Um, specifically the work of our uh, DSA coalition and the superintendent strategic plan. Um, we have organized uh, the last couple years, we've tried to simplify the big or, or the large categories that our work falls under. Um, so you'll notice a section for wellness and a section for teaching and learning. Our, um, for some reason, the plan I printed from the school committee packet, and it may have just been my printer, um, but it missed a section. So I'm going to read to you the first goal, just, just in case it didn't show up, uh, uh, social, emotional learning and wellness. In order to foster a community free from bias and discrimination and to ensure a sense of connectedness and equitable outcomes for all students, Pine Hill will foster student success and engagement by teaching through a lens of growth mindset and cultural literacy. So that's a very big, broad goal uh, relative to our school culture and practices. And you can see uh, the specific uh, action steps or strategies as we're calling them. Um, we have stuck our toe in the last couple years to understanding the social emotional learning standards established through Castle, which is uh, educationally speaking, it's a it's a national outfit for um, organization that that um, our school system thinks does the best job of defining the category the the competencies for children's growth in the um, social and emotional domains. Um, so we. Uh, We've been talking a lot about social emotional learning and we want to uh, be clearer in using and, and, and helping teachers to use those competency languages in our reports on student progress, in our parent teacher conferences, in the assessments we use when qualitatively and quantitatively when we're talking about student growth at child study meetings or grade level team meetings or um, overall uh, data team meetings, which is, which is where we talk about children's growth and how to respond if children are or are not making effective progress. So we see uh, across, across both of our elementary schools incorporating those CASEL standards. You may recall if you have children in grades three, four, and five that we uh, had parents and students fill out a survey 
about social emotional learning this year. And it was, again, we were sticking our sticking our toe in the shallow end, as I say, next, next year will be a bit deeper. And we'll also have teachers be part of um, documenting uh, through a qualitative survey tool, uh, the growth of students in, in social emotional competencies so that we have evidence of children's growth over time and that we are sure to be responsive when children uh, need additional support in order to make effective progress and uh, um, demonstrate great adjustment in pro-social skills throughout, throughout their learning day. Um, so I talk about the CASEL standards. We talk about uh, um, using uh, some curriculum resources through po uh, Pollyanna, um, which is uh, anti-racism, cultural literacy uh, that our, our DS aid committee is talking about. We of course want to be rich with all of the work we've done with responsive classroom techniques, uh, making sure that we build in time and practices that well connect our children with one another and the grown-ups around them through morning meeting, through um, uh, practices that are integrated throughout the instructional day. And, and in some cases, it's giving teachers permission. Um, I think that we, in some ways, not unlike other schools across America, became so academically focused that um, we, um, we almost needed to give teachers permission to build in integrated supports and strategies for children uh, to harness those educational moments and the, the connectivity that happens through really seeing and noticing and responding to, to, to the discourse that happens in the classroom. Um, I talk about um, uh, continuing our work to make sure that our schools are safe places for um, uh, protected classes of, of, of children, um, specifically um, gender identity and sexual orientation has, um, uh, is, is definitely um, something that our upper elementary children, gender identity impacts all of our children, um, or it could potentially impact any of our age groups. Um, but some, some of our children by, by fourth and fifth grade are, um, are expressing um, um, some wonders and, and uh, in their journeys around, around sexual preference. So I wanna make sure that we're responsive to that. Um, we've talked about uh, making sure that we have robust um, structures for our, uh, res what we used to call RTI, response to intervention, where it is now referenced as MTSS. Jen and Allison referenced uh, the tier one, the tier two, and the tier three uh, leveled in, uh, interventions for support. We have been talking about those supports for a long time in an through an academic lens. It's very important that we have just as robust systems for responding through a behavioral lens and through a social emotional lens. Uh, our continued work around all of the best practices that challenge success reminds us about um, the space acronym or, uh, and the tenets of, of challenge successes uh, space S P A C E um, is included in our school improvement plan. We've we've done a lot of work over the years, and I want to make sure that that stays on the front burner um, in in terms of our priorities and doesn't slip uh, to the back burner. Um, so that that is um, uh, those are the big picture tenants uh, for cultural responsiveness and student student wellness. Our second big picture goal is around teaching and learning. And I don't, I think this page printed well, in order to strengthen tier one instructional practices, that, again, that's what every classroom teacher is equipped to know, see, recognize, assess, and respond to with regard to student performance. Uh, Pine Hill will discuss core curriculum, instructional strategies, and literacy, increase inquiry during classroom learning time across all content areas, and increase project-based learning to increase authentic learning and assessment opportunities while reducing traditional methods. 
again, this has been a big picture. It, it, it's in line with portrait of a graduate. It's in line with all of the best practices. And then our specific dives next year will be in full implementation of the reading units of study. Many of our teachers are already reaching for those writing units of study, just as an aside, but um, aligning the reading units of study is, is the big identified goal. Um, you recall in a conversation we had one or two school committee meetings ago, I believe, I believe it was Dr. Keogh who talked about um, that, or it, it, it might have been through the budget process. We talked about how uh, instead of organizing our stipended or, or extra compensated positions for teacher leaders through the core curriculum areas, science, social studies, literacy, and math, uh, which is which is how we've compensated teachers to be teacher leaders historically at Pine Hill, that we are moving in alignment with Chickering to have uh, PLC is our acronym for professional learning communities, uh, that we are looking to have essentially a grade level team leader through K through five, as will Chickering, and those will be the folks who will help us organize our growth our uh, resource acquisition, our um, professional conversations uh, with Chickering uh, for alignment and shared practices. Uh, so instead of being content specific, we look to be grade level specific. And we feel that that will increase the number of teacher leaders we're able to support and cultivate. It will allow for lots of space to bring in social emotional learning it alongside our academic learning priorities. And so that's the structure that we'll be moving into next year. We'll have a support structure, again, both within our building-based model and then a collaborative structure with uh, those folks at Chickering and we'll feed up through our literacy specialists through the building-based administration uh, to Beth, who obviously is organizing us for lots of uh, growth and uh, specificity for aligned practices. Uh, we, we have so many different ways that we collect data about student growth. And we keep that data in a lot of different places, a little bit in Aspen, a little bit at the teacher level, a little bit in spreadsheets and lots of different kinds of computer programs we use at the building level. We are looking to streamline that um, along with the other DS schools uh, in something called panorama. And that will allow educators to look at student growth information over time more efficiently. Um, for example, sixth grade teachers, when they, if there's a student that they're worried about or they're brainstorming about how to better support a student's particular learning style, um, they have to look in a few different places now to see our to see the historical data that we've collected and the, the teacher notes. Uh, and um, so there's a, there's a um, we're looking forward to improving our efficiency. And this Panorama platform also has some curriculum resources that will be useful to teachers. So it will be um, uh, an important endeavor to help us um, differentiate instruction and respond um, to students who need challenge and students who need intervention. Uh, there's also um, an action step in there. We, we, we've been talking for a few years about modernizing our technology teacher role and our librarian teacher role to have more impact for what students are doing in the classroom uh, across curriculum areas. And uh, the pandemic has helped us fast forward the amount of technology and the breadth of how technology is used uh, at the student level and at the teacher level. So we, we wanna capitalize that and we wanna use Lori Ryan and Teresa Bienname, uh certainly to continue in some ways to work with classroom specific cohorts of children for direct instruction around technology, around research practices, uh, but we also want to have them be more uh, integrated into classrooms 
when teachers are present to take the units of study in science or social studies or literacy to a deeper level or math uh, to a deeper level using those research methods, those inquiry methods, those uh, technology tools. Um, so I see us developing in the old days, uh, technology was a special subject, the kids would go to technology and the teacher would have their prep time uh, that they're contractually entitled to. Next year, I see us doing that in a little bit more of a blurred way so that the classroom teachers and the uh, technology teacher, for example, are co-teaching children with specific and targeted uh, skills presentation goals uh, in mind. Um, there'll certainly still be a need for some direct instruction around computer software standards and um, code, the, a lot of the coding standards that um, that our kids need. Um, but a, a lot of that we, we see being integrated into the classroom. Um, the, uh, our, middle, our middle school has that model um, to some extent. Yes. I was just going to ask a question. I know we've talked in the past about um, just I think it be what Teresa is able to actually do with the students being a little bit limited because of the student to teacher ratio. And if she's in the classroom with other teachers present, I was just curious to know if we might be able to integrate some other things into the or different things into the technology curriculum. Yes, and I, I, it's sort of a backwards planning where she's looking at the content that the children are learning across all areas at the third grade level, at the fifth grade level, for example. Uh, our children will continue to have the ratio of devices that we acquired this year. Um, so we see we see that you know going to the computer lab on Tuesdays at ten o'clock as a bit of an antiquated model, and being able to be present. I don't know, maybe she's in a classroom three times in one given week, front loading uh, certain skills, data collection tools, uh, presentation tools, as children are working on crafting um, whatever it is that they're working on. And again, across all content area um, with the classroom teacher presence, because it's it's obviously um, you know the curriculum and the and the tools need to need to match and um so the ratios the ratios being um increased and the use of technology being perhaps more dynamic Great. intending intending to be more dynamic so yes <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, so I, again, that that I, uh, th those are sort of the big tenants that we talk about in our um, school improvement plan. Um, the uh, you know we're we're never not working on um, better articulating our math standards or um, refining the new social studies standards. I mean, we I could write pages and pages and pages more about what our teachers are spending time focused on um, but these these are the these are the most salient things that we want to lead with and and lift the most and they're in line with all the conversations we have uh, obviously we have you know uh, leadership team meetings with our superintendent and uh, all of our central office folks and in addition we have elementary leadership uh, principal meetings administration meetings with Beth specific to curriculum instruction and assessment so so these things aren't in a vacuum because Barb thinks they're interesting next month they're they're definitely part of our you know our bigger focus um, with regard to um, you know, as I said the, the DSA coalition work the uh, portrait of a graduate uh, innovation um, vision. May I just add one piece because I think um, Barbie touched on the fact that um, the DSA work and challenge success and the innovation work have a lot of common themes and what we want teaching and learning to look like. And I just found this out tonight and oh, Barb is gone. Um, that the uh, the panorama platform that she mentioned that's going to help uh, track our students K through 12 in terms of their academic progress, their behavioral progress, their social emotional progress. Um, also, um, 
you can tie in the portrait of a graduate competencies into that program and they've been doing that with other school systems so it's really exciting to think that we can take um you know the rubrics for empathy and the rubric for engaged citizenship and the rubric for communication and put that into panorama and then be able to see kids grow over time as they move towards graduation and hopefully you know success in college career and life so super exciting that all the pieces continue to tie together in these nice little bows so it's, that sounds great is panorama like or is um clear concise aggregation of student performance like a strategy and Paul, uh, what's it called? Panorama is the resource. Like, I, I see that it's listed there under the social emotional goal, but like, how how are we ensuring that's effectively rolled out, or like, what what's the mechanism in the school improvement plan to ensure that that's done um, the best possible way? So, panorama is. Uh, will will be our dashboard for where all our data is accessible to educators and then there's layers of resources available through the platform such as uh curriculum for social emotional learning and um so so there'll be um there'll be uh, our, our teachers will obviously need training and orientation, and, and this will be across all of DS ultimately um, uh, to to realize this platform and, and how to access it and how to use it. And then we will explore the depths of the resources available. Did I hit that okay, Beth? Yeah, I think so. So it'll be where the data is kept. And then, for example, if we realize that a student needs um, perhaps small group instruction in self-management, which is one of the social emotional um, components, then there are lessons in there that a school psychologist or a teacher can pull and use in a small group to work on those skills. Um, so it comes with the resources too. If you're wondering what the Pollyanna, is that what you're referring to? No. Um, I know I'm the new guy here, so I'm trying to sort of piece some of this together where others may have had more sort of background and I guess it seems like that tool the panorama tool is a really important um, element of ensuring that we achieve these goals so it, it it seems like it's an input into the measurement it's an input into demonstrating progress it's an input into ensuring that these are the right strategies to achieve these goals um, so maybe it's just sort of a tactical piece of it, but it seems like that's foundational to a lot of these. So I would think that there would be, or I would, I'm I guess I'm trying to understand, is there a strategy around making sure that that tool gets implemented so that it's as usable as possible to achieve these strategies to ultimately land at that goal, I guess is how I'm thinking about it, but. Yeah, so um, we have aligned the, the uh, assessments and the benchmarks that are going to be collecting data at both elementary schools. So the reading benchmark tools that we have, the math benchmark tools, our social emotional um, surveys to assess where kids are there. Um, all of that data will be inputted either automatically from the system that we've already been using. It talks to Panorama. Um, so when the teachers log on to Teachers College and do you know uh, an assessment of students reading, Panorama will pull from there or Panorama will pull from our student information system, system students attendance or students, you know, um, detentions and, and um, you know, hopefully not um, time away from school. Um, and it, it's there and we have data teams already in place that meet regularly and look at data at least quarterly uh, in terms of the academic subjects, but then as you know, things arise either academically or social emotionally throughout the year. So for uh, at Pine Hill, Allison Gullingsrud leads that data team. So she's used to working with teachers to look at data, but now it's all gonna be in one place. Um, and we are going to be having professional development in August with Panorama, who's going to teach um, Allison and her student support team and, and the, um, the grade level leaders that Barb mentioned, they'll all be at that training. So they learn how to use Panorama, Panorama, how the information gets in there, how you can look at it in multiple ways, how you can access the resources and, and track, um, you know, additional information that, that teachers might want to input with kids. 
So we have systems in place for collecting data and for analyzing data. Now we're just streamlining it um, and making sure all of that lands in Panorama as the platform. Thank you. And I'll just add that we're looking at Nextdoor as like a pilot. So that's why you probably haven't heard about this before. We, we see that this is an opportunity to use some of our CARES money because SEL is a, a large component of Panorama. So initially it's gonna be funded through um, in, in all three districts, you're using some of that uh, CARES money. Uh, the, the schools will get used to that and will be able to then probably present more to you as to um, what it can do and then also probably make a longer term commitment uh, you know, to using that as a dashboard. But we're looking at this year as a pilot year to see, you know, to investigate, figure out. Um, it will take the place of a couple other systems that we already have. So there's some um, cost savings there that we won't have to have duplicate, but I think there's a lot more to share with you guys as we, as they dive into it and get more familiar with it and, and put it into action. I think it might make sense, uh, actually, Beth, to give the school committees, all of the school committees, actually a demonstration of how this works, because Dennis is really on to something. And actually, Dennis, you're not so far off of what many of the school committee members have been asking for, for uh, asking of us for a long time, which is, you know, how do you really know? Like, how will you know when you've achieved X? How will we know when our students have made progress in Y? And uh, we really think that if we can um, use this panorama, which is really a, a gaining in popularity nationally, but certainly in our region, uh, if we can use this effectively, we think we can have a better sense of, for example, how our kids are doing emotionally. And that's a much harder thing to track, right? It's a lot of times you're tempted to say, well, I talked to 10 kids and they seem happy to me. So therefore our kids are happy. Uh, it's, it's really tough to track that. It's also very difficult to track when uh, Beth talks about the portrait of a graduate. That I'm not sure you're gonna be that familiar with, but these are the characteristics that we want our kids to graduate with. And, but they're harder to measure. Those are trickier to measure. And so if Panorama has created a, a, a mechanism for tracking that information throughout a kid's 12 years of school, that would be a beautiful thing for us. Because at the end of the day, the purpose of the portrait of a graduate is to say to people coming in, in kindergarten, here's what we want your kids to know or be able to do when they leave. Here's who they, we want them to be when they leave. And then when they leave, we want to be able to say, see, look, you can see it. You can track it. You can see their growth. So Panorama's got great potential. Um, but I think it, uh, without showing it, Beth, uh, folks are going to be a little foggy on it. Yeah, that's a great idea. What I might suggest, if it's okay with the, the committee, is to wait until August or September once we've been through the training ourselves and, and know the ins and outs of it a little better. <clears throat> Yeah, because it'd be a little overwhelming. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because then you could break it down and show us the salient points and, you know, because we don't need to know all of it. We just need to know how it works and how it's measured. And it may be more like a December, January when you actually really, and then that's uh, coincides with um, sort of the budget season. Could be. We've come a long way with data. The state has something called data warehouse where just if you're thinking about on the most basic level MCAS, and CAS results can give you some important information. You can see, for example, whether teacher A is having the same kind of growth in their students as teacher B. And you can see you know, how Pine Hill compares to another school system with a similar demographic uh, and a similar um, uh, makeup. And, uh, but this this is a, 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 a step beyond. This is like this is like data warehouse on steroids. This is this has got great potential, but we we are going to have to kind of wrap our heads around it and make sure that it works for us. But it's a good question, Dennis, and we need to keep you you. I, my advice to you as the person who's leaving is to keep asking those questions about how we're using that data and what it's telling us. In the meantime, I do have a couple short videos that are um, 
that we received now that we're, we're partnering with Panorama next year, I'm happy to share them with your committee and you can watch them at your leisure just to get a sense of it. Yeah, I, some of these may be more um, um, able to be measured with sort of statistics where others of these strategies may be a little bit um, softer or, or harder to measure, but it would be interesting to see in this, um, in the improvement plan, which one of these strategies you feel may be measurable in one way, shape or form and what attributes of data that's in Panorama or whatever other system to try to encourage that. Because I think if I think back over the past year, three kids in the school system, we had an interesting window into how our kids get educated that I don't think we necessarily fully had before, right? Like we were actually sitting down next to them doing some of the um, learning and whatnot that would have exclusively happened in the school, you know, 15, 18 months ago. And I think, um, you know, helping parents and helping the teachers and educators bridge the, the communication, I'll call it divide, but the communication path between the parents who are trying to keep the kids on track when they're outside of school, the teachers that are trying to lean on the parents to kind of help reinforce some of those messages and how it is that we're measuring and trying to apply all this good stuff that we're talking about here into moving Pine Hill into the next, you know, you know, in the future, whatever, the, whatever that is. So it's a really good point, Dennis. And, and uh, actually, in my trip to Finland and I, uh, prior to your joining the school committee, the whole leadership team went, uh, or all of the principals and Beth, I should say, and I had already gone, so I did not take that trip. But one of the things that was really impressive to me about Finland was the relationship between the parents and the teachers. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, the teachers uh, viewed the parents as partners in the learning experience. So it's interesting to me that you say you've had a glimpse that you never had before through this pandemic, because that's really true. And I wonder if, if the families in Finland would say the same thing, that they don't know as much about how their kids are learning or what their kids are learning, because I don't think that would be the case. I think they would say, oh, no, 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 we're partners in it completely. So yeah, it's a really good point. Really good point. Anyone else have any questions or things they want to know? Because again, this is the first read of the school improvement plan. And so um, we can go through it. And I, I, I do think that one part that you read, Dr. Brown, that you printed off, I don't think it did come through on that first, or maybe not on my packet. I don't know. So, but when we do this, the second read when we vote, we'll just make sure we go through all of them. Okay. Dr. Dr. Brown, is there anything that you would ask what we specifically look for in this that you guys wanted an additional point of view on or confirmation? Obviously, we'll vote on it, but in our review. I think most of our work, I don't know that there's a whole, that there's many new tenants to our school improvement plan. I think it's been taking some of the big bullseyes we've been focused on to a deeper level. Um, um, that's a great question. I um, uh, appreciate, as, as John mentioned, the school committee has been very supportive of um, letting us harness resources if, both through the operational budget and through some of the supplemental grant opportunities or federal funding available to us. Um, we've, we've um, uh, you know, as, as Don said, some, some of our practices are replacing materials uh, that we used to purchase and others are, are posing for a new cost. So um, we've really been working hard this year to streamline um, the types of software, the types of consumable materials, the types of tax uh, that we purchase um, in support of, uh, I, I guess a distinction I would make is when I started, when I started working in Dover Sherborne, our, our school improvement plan looked a little bit more like a checklist, um, but the, it, it was often, it was often um, working on moving forward in smaller goal areas. And now we have these really big picture visions around social emotional learning and portrait of a graduate, challenge success, um, our DEI work, et cetera. 
Um, and so to try to break those down into measurable component pieces. So we're, we're almost approaching school improvement. Um, we're going from big picture to, to, to smaller action steps. And it's almost the opposite process of what I experienced almost uh, nine or 10 years ago when I started here. So, um, uh, and the connectedness the connectedness uh, K through 12 and, and, and specifically K8 with some of our curricular philosophy. And, and uh, so um, lots and lots of momentum behind, behind these areas that we've, that we've identified. And again, as I said, not in a vacuum, you know, through, through our, you know, through our, lots of our conversations and, and uh, um, district wide. So it's, it's a really stimulating time to be part of the DS school system. Great. I do like how though that you were saying it's a building block because it did back in the day education was segmented. It was elementary, then middle school, then high school, but now it is more of a step ladder. We're moving them on to the next step. I, I think you were on Angie on the school committee when I came, correct? Mm -hmm. So uh, Barb, what Barb's referencing, um, and I think for your kind of edification, Dennis, and for future reference. What we were trying to do, what Barb's talking about is that we were somewhat disjointed, we felt, as a district. The leadership team felt, and I was hearing that in my entry um, uh, interviews, that we were kind of disjointed and pulling in multiple directions. And that what we wanted was, as a system, to be all be pulling in the same direction. So, for example, when a kid comes over from Pine Hill, they shouldn't hit the wall at the middle school with completely different learning uh, and teaching approaches and areas of focus. And let's see if we can get a little more consistency. And so one logical thing is to look at our school improvement plans for each school and make sure they align with the district plans because that's hugely important. But the second part that's really important is the part that you raised, which is, well, how will we know when we've achieved these things? So right now, what, we, what we've done is we created the strategic plan at the district level which all of our school improvement plans spin off of, our building school improvement plans spin off of. We've created the strategic plan with the kind of five big buckets of area focus and then the more specific goals and objectives underneath those kind of big uh, strategic priorities. And then the, the next step has been consists uh, in the past few years, and we're working on it right now as a leadership team is going back and looking at our specifics, the specific action steps that we said we were going to do and uh, assessing and grading ourselves on our progress towards those. And the reason we're doing that is so that you, as the people on the school committee can see, wow, they're not just blowing smoke. These are the things that they said that they were going to be working on and accomplishing, accomplishing and they have. And that's something that's really important to me as a leader. I, I do not like, uh, and I was on the Sherburn School Committee once upon a time, I do not like being part of a system that's um, spinning all over the place, but really doesn't have any targets and um, nobody really knows where we're going. We, uh, and I'm not saying that was the case for Dover Sherburn, but I do think that we needed to... Um, uh, hone in on our focus, you know, refocus. And um, I think that the next strategic plan should uh, obviously continue to do that. And that's, that's next steps for probably your new superintendent, not for your interim, but. And these so, goals will drive, these goals, Dennis, will drive, you know, our allocation of resources, not, not just from a budgetary standpoint, uh, but the very precious, uh, collaborative time that we have built in through early release days and our teacher workshop days um, will be sanctioned uh, to, to perpetuate a deeper understanding and practice in these areas next year. And Beth, yes. and Beth, Beth helps us, you know, align all of that. And, um, you know, sometimes we, it, it makes sense to share resources across the building simultaneously or to use the same resources but in a building-based way, um, you know, with our with our individual faculties. So, so all of that goes into um, 
uh, bringing these plans alive and, and helping us actualize the growth. Okay. Oh, Angie, by the way, one last thing. I will make sure that you guys get the copies that Barb was working off of. I apologize for that. I'm not sure where the breakdown was. I think it's mostly in there. I think there might just be a page or two that's off. I don't know. Okay, like well, I said, I was, I was printing it, weird things. But before our second read, too, we'll go through that. And so. We'll absolutely have it to you soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, so finally, if we're satisfied with our school improvement plan first read, we can go on to the approval of the minutes for March 9th of 2021. And I read through it, and I didn't see. I know March was only a couple months ago, but it seems like a year ago. I don't know. It seems like dog years. Did anyone have any um, corrections that needed to be made or that they saw? Okay, so if not, do I have a motion to approve the minutes for March 9th of 2021 of the um, school committee meeting? So moved, Megan Page. Do I have a second? Second, that was quantum. Thank you. Do I have any discussion? And hearing none, I'll just um, pull the members. Nancy? Nancy Cradell, yes. Dennis? Dennis Quant, yes. Um, Megan? <clears throat> Megan Page, yes. And Angie Johnson, yes. So our minutes are approved. And if you have um, extra time and you want to just read the other minutes to see what's going on everywhere else, it's always nice to see what's going on on the other side of the river. And that I think will be it. So um, do I have a raise of hands for my committee to see if you wish to adjourn? All right, we're adjourned and it's 818. Thank you all very much. We had a lot to cover, but we, I don't think it took too terribly long. Thank you. And Thanks we learned everybody. a whole lot.